would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, John Verico is a professional speaker and trainer on communication and motivational leadership. He is the president of the National Association of Government Communicators and has more than 33 years of experience as a public affairs professional in federal and state government agencies, working extensively in media, community, and employee relations. John retired from the Navy Reserve as a Master Chief Journalist in 2005. As a former freelance journalist, stand-up comic, janitor, theater performer, small business consultant, and disco dance instructor, awesome, John has learned not to take life too seriously and to experience everything life has to offer. Ain't that the truth? He earned a master's degree in organizational leadership from Norwich University and a bachelor's in communication from the University of the State of New York. John's spare time is devoted to occasional cruise vacations, bad movie parties, awesome, and, and collecting classic monster movies and memorabilia, which he displays in his bizarre version of a man cave. I want to hear more about that. Welcome, John. Well, good evening. How are you? I need to turn on the sound, don't I? Can you hear me now? There we go. Let's try it again. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? This has been fun so far. The announcements were, were amazing. I feel like I have to give something away. <laughs> and it started off with the speed dating there, the PMI Harmony job sharing thing. That was, that was a lot of fun. I already can tell you're a fun group just from the intera brief interaction I've had with some of you out here and just sitting here at the head table and, and chatting with folks. And I was so glad to have been invited to come out and talk to you today. So yes, I do have a bizarre collection of monster movie memorabilia. I'll talk to you a little bit about that later on. Uh, a local newspaper came out and saw my collection and they called it my bizarre man cave. Actually, no, they called it my demented man cave. <laughs> I've been collecting monster movie memorabilia for about 25 years. And the reason why I got into the whole concept of monster movies, why I thought they were so intriguing, was that when I was a kid, I was a little kid. I was the guy who got picked on all the time. I was five foot three and weighed 110 pounds when I graduated high school. I was the second shortest guy in my school. I couldn't even be first at being the shortest. <laughs> I had a growth spurt in my senior year. I wound up being half an inch taller than the other short guy. But I was a little skinny kid. And one thing you learn when you're a little skinny kid and you're getting picked on all the time and you're not a good athlete, I was called the mighty mosquito on the wrestling team. Mostly because I got swatted. I wasn't a singer, I didn't perform in, in the choir, I didn't perform in theater or any of that kind of stuff. I did a variety of things that were kind of mediocre. So when you're in that role, you kind of look for heroes to, to turn to, right? So I read a lot of comic books when I was a kid, and I said, I wish I was a superhero, but I knew I wasn't gonna get bit by a radioactive spider, or get you know influenced by cosmic rays. So I knew becoming a superhero was probably not going to happen, especially since I didn't want to train like Batman. When I watched monster movies, however, I noticed something. No matter how big and bad and dangerous and nasty the monster was, the little guy won. The underdog always wound up winning. And they did it through innovation. They did it through teamwork. They did it through coming together for a common cause and to listening to everybody who had the most bizarre ideas to take something down. He's up on the top of the Empire State Building. We'll never get to him now. What do we do? We've lost her. How about airplanes? So when people come up with ideas, you got to reach out and grab those ideas and make them part of the whole process. And all of a sudden, you have a solution. So. That's my intrigue with monster movies. I've been attracted to them ever since. And uh, when we say bad movie parties, those are the kind of bad movies we like to watch. But I'm here to talk about how to get people to come up with those innovative ideas. How do we get people so involved 
in solving the challenge that they come up with the ideas, that they're willing to be part of the team. We say when people are not really performing at work, you know, they're kind of checked out, they've gone fishing, as I say, and that's, that's what, I, what led to the title here. I do, oh, we do have the clicker. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to start off by talking about motivation. So understanding, we have a lot of assumptions about what motivates people. A few years ago, I was teaching a uh, course for blue-collar first-line supervisors about leadership and motivation and how they need to motivate their workforce. And I had a guy in the group who stood up and said, hey, it is not my job to motivate my employees. We give them a paycheck for that. How many of you are motivated strictly by your paycheck? And I know some of you got some sweet paychecks. This guy's arm came up. I saw it. <laughs> so I, I looked at this guy and I said, now look, you have, you're working for the government. He said, yes. I said, how long have you been working for the government? He said, 35 years. 35 years. You are a master carpenter, a master plumber, and a master electrician. You are the triple threat in the trades. How much do you make an hour here in the government? And how much can you, with those skills, make outside of the government? Oh, I can make so much more money. I can make a lot of money. Then why did you stay here for 35 years if you could make so much more money outside? He says, well, I like what I'm doing. I like the people I'm working with. I like working for the government. I like working for the Department of the Navy because I feel like I'm giving back. I said, so you are not motivated by your paycheck, are you? Well, no. So why do you think your employees are? And we have a tendency to just think that way. What motivates us must be what motivates them, or they're not as good as me, so they must be motivated by lesser things. We have a tendency to do that in almost everything. When you're trying to get, I work a lot in the medical community, and folks will come to me and they'll say, John, we just can't get our patients to take their medicine. We can't get people to keep their appointments. We can't get them to go to the specialist they're supposed to go to. We keep telling them if they don't do this, they're going to die. But they won't do it. I said, did you ever wonder that maybe your patients are not motivated by the fear of death? How many of you are terrified of dying? How many of you, oh, it's going to happen, right? How many of you are more mortified about the concept of coming up on stage and talking to people? <laughs> you know, that is the number one fear, is public speaking, because people are afraid of being embarrassed. <coughs> so a number of years ago, I had the pleasure, where's the clicker, here it is. I had the pleasure, when I worked for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, I had the pleasure of working with birds of prey. It was very, very cool. These were all injured animals that could not be released out into the wild. And so we worked with them. Uh, we, we got them as healthy as possible. And then we would take them out to schools and to public events and teach people about these wonderful animals. And the great horned owl was one of my personal favorites. It's a beautiful bird. It's a stunning bird. When you look at this, this creature, he's perfectly designed for everything that he needs to do. And if you look right here and look at those claws, look at those talons. Not only are they razor sharp and about that long, but a great horned owl squeezes at about 350 PSI. They kill their prey by crushing their spine. So you tell this to people, do not get close to this bird. <laughs> and they will get right up close to it, because he's cute. We also had a black vulture. Not the prettiest in the bird family. Also perfectly designed for what he, what he needs to do. 
But where the owl's beak is designed for ripping and tearing, the vulture's beak, although it looks long and nasty, is actually on the softer side. Now, I don't want to get into details about what he eats because I know we're still having dessert. But that, that is designed to get in between the bones and get out all the soft bits. His feet do not have claws. They do not have talons. They are designed for balancing, not for ripping or tearing or crushing. And you tell people, this bird cannot hurt you. How do you think a vulture defends himself? Flies away. He does, but what does he do first? He pukes on you. <laughs> so I'm not going into detail of what that can smell like, OK? But you tell that to, to people, and you say, this bird will hurt you. It will rip your eyeballs out and feed them to you. That bird will embarrass you. They'll jump back 20 feet away from the vulture, and they'll get up close to the, to the owl. Because they're not motivated by what we think they are. Because if you get attacked by an owl and you've got this nasty injury, you've got a cool story. <laughs> if you get puked on by a vulture, yeah, you go wash it off, but everybody knows and laughs at you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really hard to understand how this works for people. How people are, you know, understanding that people are not motivated by what we think they are. Now, I talked a little bit about the paycheck thing. And uh, there were some studies done of volunteers in a variety of roles. And I know a number of you are volunteers. The board. I also am a volunteer, even though I'm a Navy guy. Any former Navy here? Quite a few. Thank you for your service. Other services, by the way, just out of curiosity. All right. Thank you. Those of you who are in the Navy know that Navy is an acronym. Never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> but we do it anyway. It, it's in our blood. So there was a study, there were several studies done of groups of volunteers, and they tried to understand, you know, what, what happens with people as they're, why they volunteer in the first place. And so with a couple of different organizations, they tried to acknowledge the volunteers. They would give them a little certificate. They might have an awards dinner every year or so and have people come in and they give them a little thank you and they say, hey, thanks for all the great work you're doing here. Um, here's a gift card. Oh, that's almost like money. Oh, you know what? We actually uh, were a little flush this year, so we're going to give you a little stipend to reward you for the volunteer work that you've been doing. And what was noticed was that before this financial offering, people were really in tune with doing what they had signed up to do. They showed up in time for their shifts. They did everything they, you know, that they were asked to do. They volunteered to do extra stuff. They took charge of things. But as soon as they started getting a little bit of pay, it became a job. And they didn't show up for work in time. Understanding that it no longer was what was motivating them. What motivated them was the altruisticness, the, the concept of doing something because they wanted to do it, not because they had to do it. As soon as it became something they had to do, they no longer were interested. I think you can probably tell by now that uh, I am not your average motivational speaker. All right, those guys wear Armani suits. They have perfectly white teeth that you can see from back there. And they are perfectly physically fit. My designer is J.C. Penier. <laughs> I have my own natural teeth, thank you very much. And the rest is obvious. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who's a power lifter. He bench presses 400 pounds. He says, come to the gym with me. I'm like, <laughs> spot me. Dude, if you can't lift it, I can't help you. <laughs> and you got people in here who are so incredibly fit as a look around, too. And he knows Jason is so fit, he was giving away a Fitbit. He goes, I don't even need this. <laughs> right? 
Sorry, Badu, but you know. <laughs> and the young lady who won it doesn't really need it either. Uh, she's like, yeah, I got this. You, sir. Come up here for a second. Come on. Yes, you. Kyle, is it? I can't. Eric, can't read from here. Thanks. Come on up, Eric. Look at this guy. I noticed Eric sitting here, and I noticed one thing about him. He's pretty fit. Do you work out? Don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. Do you work out? A little bit. A little bit. What's a little bit? How often do you go to the gym? <laughs> gym, I don't do that. Okay, so what do you do? What, what kind of workout do you do? I bike ride outside. You bike ride. Are you one of these distance guys? Mm, mountain bike. Mountain bike. How often do you go? When the weather's nice. <laughs> Pretty much every day. <laughs> And how, how, how much riding do you do? How many miles? Do do? Don't be embarrassed. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> 10, 12 miles a ride? Every day? No. Or every time you go out? Yes. That's a lot of exercise. That's a lot of work. What motivates you to do it? It's fun. It's fun. What else? What else do you get? You get the, that, that thrill? And... It's fresh air. Fresh air in DC? No. Oh, no. <laughs> you you weren't in the part of DC I was today. I did my nine-minute mile today. I did, which I mean that's not really fast. I realized that, but I was in the car <laughs> in the traffic. So, but but no. So so you go out there, you work out, makes you feel good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel healthy? Uh, I I think so. Yes. You think so? Are you embarrassed that I brought you up here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Eric, you are motivated to get out there and do stuff that I just can't get myself to do. Okay? You're motivated to do things that, that I don't. But you want to be healthy, you're happy, you enjoy the outdoors, right? I also enjoy the outdoors. I also want to be healthy. I want to live a nice long life. I'm sure you do as well. So Eric is motivated to go out there and ride a bike. I am not motivated to go out and ride a bike, okay? I am not motivated like my power lifter friend. Guess what motivates me? <laughs> what is the sense, what is the sense of living a nice long life if I can't eat and enjoy the things I like? I am motivated by the flavor of food and that's what gets me going. Now, despite all of that, and I know that we are in very different physical conditions, but I'm not out of shape, because round is a shape. <laughs> and, the mo the, and physicists have told us the most perfect shape in the universe is the sphere. So Eric, all of your work out, yeah, my body is closer to perfection than yours is. So. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So there are some things we have to understand about motivation. There's three basic principles of motivation to understand what makes people tick. Okay? The first thing, and this is going to sound weird coming from a motivational speaker, okay? but I can't motivate people. I can't motivate people, and neither can you. Because motivation is a very personal thing. People are motivated by what's inside them, right? The second principle of motivation, all people are motivated. And I already saw some, some looks around the room. How many of you think that all your workforce is motivated? Your teenagers? <laughs> They're motivated by something, exactly. Everybody's motivated, they're just not necessarily motivated to do what you want them to do. And then the third principle of motivation that you have to understand is that people do things for their own reasons and not yours. 
So I started this off talking about fishing. We say gone fishing. People have gone fishing. They've checked out and they've gone fishing. There is an old Chinese proverb that says if you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime. Very profound. Do you believe it? I don't. Because there's something missing. You could give that man everything he needs to fish. You can give him all the equipment. You can give him all the information. Go to this river this time of day. Use this kind of bait. Go to this depth. Here's how to set the hook. Everything he needs to know in order to fish. But he still might not do it unless he understands why he should. That why is the critical aspect of it. How many times when we were kids did your mom say, would you say, can I go out and play? No. Why not? Because we have to go see grandma. Why? I want you to stay in the house today. Why? You want to know why. We always want to know why. Because if you don't know why, you're not motivated to, do, to take the action. Same thing with our fisherman. If he doesn't understand why he needs to go out and fish, he has all the information he needs to do it. He has all the tools. But unless he understands why he should, he won't. So, in understanding that, when you're trying to tell folks, give them the information they need in order to make their own decision to be motivated, in order to do the things that's going to motivate themselves, you have to understand what's playing in here. So, how many people like music? Deborah, what kind of music do you like? Uh, New Orleans jazz. Jazz? New Orleans jazz. Very specific kind of jazz, not just jazz, not just any jazz will do. New Orleans jazz. Love it. Where's Olive? Olive, where'd you go? I'll pick on him later then. What kind of music do you like, sir? R&B. R&B? Okay. You, ma'am, in the black and white? Classical music. Classical music. Different kinds of music. Anybody for classic rock and roll? Ooh! Country? Blues? We all have different tastes in music. But we all actually do one thing. We listen to the same radio station. It's a very eclectic station. Everything plays on it. It's called WIIFM. You have to do that in a radio voice. WIIFM. It's an acronym, of course. Anybody know what it means? What's in it for me? You've heard it before. Exactly. <laughs> everything that you do and everything that other people do is filtered through their WIIFM radio station. <laughs> they are deciding whether or not to pay attention, whether or not to listen, whether or not to take action based on whether or not there is something in it for them. You're doing that right now. You do it to your boss. You do it to coworkers. You do it to your kids. You're doing it to that fat Italian guy up in the front of the room. You're like, hey, why should I listen to this guy? Does he have anything of value for me? There's something called Vroom's expectancy theory. Victor Vroom was a college professor, I think, in Minnesota. I'll have to double check that. I'm sorry if I forgot where he was from. But basically what he's saying that people will put forth effort to do something, to take some action based on what they believe the outcome is going to be and then the value they place on that outcome. So people will only do so much for that certain outcome. So if you're dangling that paycheck carrot, people are only going to put, so so, put forth so much effort. But understanding what motivates people understanding how to get to what's important to them, you might actually get them to go beyond that because they see more value in it. So I want to give you a story, another story back from my days with the uh, Department of Natural Resources in Maryland. I like telling these stories because they're, they're more fun than modern stuff that I do, security stuff. These are the fun stories. So we had, we had one message that we wanted to get through to folks across the state of Maryland. We wanted people to plant trees. Pretty basic message. 
Two words, plant trees. We realized people weren't listening to us when we said, go out and plant trees. They're like, why should we plant trees? So we realized that, we, that every different group that we wanted to talk to had a different reason for why they would plant trees. So one of the first groups we targeted were school kids, because kids are already kind of in tune with the environmental stuff. You know, they're the ones that come home and go, Daddy, that goes in the recycling bin, not in the garbage can. So we figured we're going to get these kids on our side. We're going to tell them how much fun it is to go and plant trees. And our forest rangers would go out every year and they would collect pine cones and they would get the seeds out of the pine cones and they would grow seedlings. And so at Arbor Day, every year, every third grader in the state of Maryland got a baby tree about that big. Go forth and plant your tree. This is your tree. So these kids would go home. Mommy, Daddy, I want to plant my tree. And we live in an apartment. <laughs> so they planted it in a park. They planted it you know, on school grounds. They planted it in their backyards if they had property. Those trees, a lot of them, a great majority of them got planted because the parents didn't want to upset their kids. And we, you know, we, we explained to kids, it's fun. You get dirty. You, you get to do all kinds of cool stuff. And that tree will be there when you're as old as your dad. And that's your tree. That little sense of ownership. And they were protective over that tree. We had kids that run out to the park to go and water the tree. They'd carry a cup at a time to go to the community park. It was great. There were great, great stories that came out of that time. So now that's great for the people who happen to have a third grader. But not everybody in the state has a third grader. Not everybody even has kids. So if we wanted homeowners to plant trees, we had to approach them from the perspective of what is it that was going to drive them to plant trees? What are homeowners interested in? Property value, beautification, curb appeal, maybe money savings. So by approaching them from the perspective of it add, trees add value to your property, they add curb appeal, uh, people are more attracted to, to lots that have trees on them. By the way, trees, if they're big enough and they're close to the home and they can provide some shade, cut down on what you're spending for air conditioning. All those reasons were what we had, how we had to explain to people why they needed to plant trees. And another group we wanted to talk to were the land developers. And those were the guys with the chainsaws and the bulldozers who were cutting them down in the first place, right? Now, there was a law in the state of Maryland that said, there was a Forest Conservation Act that said, every tree that you cut down, Mr. Land Developer, you have got to plant two. They're like, well, that's not going to work out here. So we had to show them how to build things like a mitigation forest. We had to show them how they can actually prepare a subdivision and still leave trees on the property, original trees, not worry about planting new ones, but they can actually work around some of those original trees, which would then add value to the subdivision, which means you could sell those lots for more money. So those were the kinds of eye-openers for them. For them, it was the dollars. For the homeowners, it was, yeah, the dollars. And for the kids, it was just the fun of it. So, for, but understanding that each group we were talking to, and they, even those were generalizations, obviously, but understanding that each group we were talking to had their own motivation. So if you're trying to get people to take an action, you're trying to get people to do stuff, you have to understand where they're coming from, what's going on in their head, what is the most likely thing that is going to get them motivated. And if you don't know, ask them. Let me. I keep putting this down and forgetting where they do it what I do with it. I have CRS. Can't remember stuff. <laughs> Don't laugh. A few years ago, actually it was quite a few years ago now, my wife and I were walking. That's my wife, by the way, Bonnie. She's sitting there going, he's all mine. <laughs> <laughs> but a number of years ago, we were at some, some shore location. I think it was Atlantic City. And we walked past a t-shirt shop, and there was a t-shirt that said, I'm suffering from CRS. Can't remember stuff. So we laughed about it. We thought it was a it was fine little joke. And we went down, down the boardwalk a ways. And then, I don't know, about an hour or so later, she was reminding me of some other discussion and, that I did not recall. And she goes, CRS. 
And I turned around and said, what's CRS? <laughs> yeah. What could I say? It happens as we get older. Our minds get so, so wrapped up in trying to address all of the different messages, all the different communications that are coming at us constantly. We're constantly trying to filter things out through the what's important to me, you know, what's in it for me kind of a filter. What things are we retaining? It's not that my, my wife said was not important to me. It's just other things kind of jumped in in between. But when you're trying to get people to become motivated, you, like I started to say earlier, they need to become part of it. They need to understand it's got to be their idea or their choice to, do the, to take the action. There's a uh, motivational speaker, Michelangelo Caruso, nice Polish guy. Uh, that is his real name, by the way. I can't make that up. Um, but he said people don't want to take orders. They want to take part. People want to feel like they're part of something. They don't want to just be told, do this. They don't want to be micromanaged. I unfortunately have worked for folks who were mega micromanagers. Really, really bad. When I first reported aboard my Navy ship, when I first joined the Navy, fresh out of boot camp, fresh out of the defense information school where I learned how to be a Navy journalist, I reported aboard the ship and when I first was talking to you get to meet everybody in your chain of command. You, know, you meet your immediate supervisor and the petty officer and the chief petty officer and the division, direct, the division officer and then all the way up the chain to the commanding officer. And everybody was nice to me and welcoming. Have a seat there, Seaman Verico. Welcome aboard. Except for the XO. The executive officer actually kept me standing there at attention. While he's looking at my meager service jacket, which basically says, Boot camp and defense information school. That's it. <laughs> and he says, a flippin' journalist, huh? Yes, sir. What the heck am I supposed to do with a flippin' journalist? Well, sir, the Navy says this ship gets a journalist, so here I am. Don't you give me any lips, son. We don't need a journalist on this ship. We had a journalist on this ship. 18 months ago. Do you know what happened to our, our journalist, Seaman Verico? No, sir. We kicked his butt out of the Navy. Do you know why we kicked him out of the Navy, Seaman Verico? No, sir, because he was a flipping fruitcake. <laughs> Are you a fruitcake, Seaman Verico? No, sir, you better not be. And don't you pull any of your defense information school training on me. I have a degree in communication. What did he just communicate to me? <laughs> Basically, nothing I did from that point forward was going to satisfy him. Every single document that I produced, he edited to death. You've heard of happy to glad kind of changes. This was like changing happy to mildly amused. Everything I sent up came back covered in red ink. Now, this was the day before computers, before word processors. We didn't even have an electric typewriter. It was manual typewriters. And we were not allowed to send up carbons. We did have a copy machine, however. So I'd send up the one press release, and he would rip it apart. And we'd come back and I'd look at it and they were all those kind of changes because he had to show me how much of a better editor he was than I was. And I looked at all those changes and I went, there is not one legitimate fix anywhere in this piece of work. So I, I had made two copies so I had a file copy of the original. And I just took the second copy and I put it in the folder and I sent it back up. But my excuse, of course, was that, oh, I goofed and gave you the wrong copy. You know, I got approved. Because he was trying to make a point that he was in charge. And that he wanted to, know, wanted to tell me exactly how I did everything that I did. And no way that I did it was going to be satisfactory to him unless it was his way. He didn't make a copy of his own notes. 
So he wasn't double checking his own self, right? <laughs> So he ultimately left, and a new XO came on board, and he said, uh, hey, uh, at this point I was a petty officer. He goes, petty officer Verico, I'm glad that, uh, that you're here. Um, I'm very proactive for public affairs. I really want to get the story out. So um, I'm looking forward to working with you. You can come directly with me. The division officer really doesn't know what he's doing anyway, so you can just come directly. I was the only public affairs person on the ship, by the way. And I was like, this is great. He goes, I just want to let you know that from this point forward, I only need one copy of whatever you produce. Okay. He goes, oh, yes, Commander Kaufman was on to you. I said, why did he let me get away with it? He said he was testing you. He wanted to see how far you would take it. When he had something in there that was a legitimate change, you made the change. We don't have to play that game. He said, you're the public affairs person. You went to training for it. If I have an edit or a suggested edit, tell me if it's right or wrong. If you can defend that, it's fine. Sweet. He enabled me. He helped me to understand where I fit in, what my role was, and he, he showed me that he believed in me. He empowered me to take action and to take ownership of what it is that I produced. That's another thing that's very, very important about understanding motivation is understanding where you fit in and what, the, what your work is doing. Have you ever heard of the, I put this down again, didn't I? You got a lanyard on these things, you need to. <laughs> the parable of the three bricklayers, have you heard this one? It's been out for, uh, it's, it's, it's ancient. But basically, there were three bricklayers working on a construction site. And a guy's walking down the street, and he comes to the first bricklayer who's just slapping bricks in a stack and laying in, the, uh, laying in the mortar, but just really just stacking them up, not really paying attention to what he's doing, it looked like. And so the gentleman says to him, so what is it that you're doing? He goes, I'm stacking bricks. What does it look like I'm doing? OK. So he moves on down, and he sees the second bricklayer. This guy is taking a little more care in lining up the bricks. He's putting pretty much an even code of mortar in between and stacking them pretty evenly, and it's coming along pretty well. And he says, so what is it that you're doing? He goes, I'm building a wall. He goes, oh, that, that, that makes sense. So he goes down to the third guy, and this third guy is meticulous in the way he's lining up the bricks. He's got, you know, he's measuring the thickness of the mortar. Everything is perfectly aligned. He's doing beautiful work. And even with all this extra care he's putting into it, he's made more progress than his counterparts. And so the gentleman asks him, what is it that you're doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. And that understanding of what the final product is is what motivated him. Understanding of where he fits in and what he is contributing to was, helped, was what helped to motivate him. How are we doing on time? Looks like we're OK so far. So understanding that when you've got different people who all have a different perspective on what is going on and where they fit into things and, how they're, and they're all motivated differently, sometimes we need to understand how this all meshes together when you've got several different personalities, several, several different perspectives, uh, uh, all into one group. And so a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to hire people who are like me. Does that ever work out? We need diversity, right? So here's an example that I created a number of years ago, trying to understand this box is your challenge. You're trying to figure out what is inside the box. There's only two holes, two views into the box, one from the top and one from the side. If you only look in through the top, you see a circle. That's the only perspective you have. That's all you know. So you say inside this box is a circle. But if you look in through the side, somebody else is looking in through the side, and they see a triangle. So in their mind, what's inside that box is a triangle. Understanding you still don't know what's inside the box, do you? Because from one perspective, your, your people are seeing a circle, so that person's telling you they see a circle. The other person's telling you they see a, a, a triangle. It doesn't make sense. 
But understanding, when you take those two perspectives and put them together, you, under, you realize that what is inside the box is a cone. But you would not have figured that out unless you had everybody's perspective. I saw some nods. I like that. I like when I get people going, I got that. So I want to do something. Uh, we have pretty much stopped eating at the moment. I'd like to do a quick exercise. I know it's the word. I'm going to do a quick exercise with you. This will only take a moment. I'd like everybody to please stand up. And what I'd like you to do is partner up with somebody. So, so be a partner. All right, everybody amongst you, pick a partner. Now, about between you, you decide amongst yourselves. One of you will be partner A, and one of you will be partner B. You decide, just one, just one on one, sir. <laughs> These are conventional partners, okay? So, <laughs> so one of you is going to be partner A, and one is partner B. Has everybody decided amongst yourselves that one is one, one is the other? Okay. All the partner A's, raise your hand. Okay, make a fist. Partner A, make a fist. All right, when I say go, partner B, I want you to try to open partner A's fist. Ready, go. <laughs> Stop. Stop. There was some knuckle cracking over here. Somebody get their foot stepped on. This is great stuff. Let's have some fair play. So partner B, you make a fist. And when I say go, partner A, you get some get back and you try to open partner B's fist. Ready? Go. Stop. 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 Sit down. Relax. Oh my. You know? So, how many of you were successful in opening your partner's fist? You were, sir. And how did you do it? I just asked him. You just asked him. <laughs> there was knuckle breaking over here. I've seen, in other places I've done this, I've seen people tickle the other person, distract, <laughs> bribe them with cash. Yeah. I mean, I said this word over and over and over again. I said partner. And as soon as I said go, you became opponents. <laughs> you communicated with full frontal violence. <laughs> and it only dawned on one, maybe a couple of people to actually just ask. Was in the My partner. <laughs> you asked also. You were successful. Very good. Yeah. You just said no. Okay. You were the uncooperative partner. He said, would you open your fist? She goes, no. Uh-uh. Make me. <laughs> the, thing I want, the, thing I'm trying, the point I want to make here is that no matter what, we are partners. We're actually going in the same direction. We're working on the same end goal. Okay. We're not alone. We've got other people that we can rely on. We've got a team. We've got a network. Being a member of this organization, look at all these people in here that you can call on if you've got a challenge that you've never faced before. We don't realize that, that we are not alone and that there's all these opportunities for us to solve our challenges because we can all help each other. And the motivation to help each other is that you don't wind up with broken knuckles. Now, uh, the motivation to help each other is that you can accomplish your goals. Have. So understanding all of these things and all these perspectives, I want you to go home with just one thing. I want you to remember one thing, where the clicker is. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to say right there. I'm just any one thing. I don't really care what it is that you might take away from this. 
but take away something. Get some value out of being here, okay? But in all the thing, whether, whether uh, uh, you listened uh, to Gerald earlier for the PMI Tools event or, or just from this goofing around here tonight or even with the, uh, the PMI Harmony thing earlier, remember something. There's, all, there's good stuff here, okay? And so take your opportunity as you have access to information, you have access to each other, learn something from every single experience that you have. I tell people this all the time, learn something new every day. And so if you like, I do have, I don't use business cards as much, I actually use bookmarks. Because I want to encourage people to learn something. Go out there and read. So if you'd like one of these, please come and, and take one. But it says, learn something new every day, and then just stick this in your book as a constant reminder. And you have my ugly mug sticking up at the top of the book to remind you and like make you shame you into learning something. <laughs> you want the bookmark on your Kindle? I'll send it to you as a PDF. <laughs> so with that, I'll open it up for uh, any questions. Sir. Do you find that uh, the, the motivation techniques you were talking about tonight work for all generations, or do some things work different for other generations? You know, they work for everyone, and understanding that people are motivated differently. Now, different generations have different versions of that motivation, but they are also self-motivated. So, yes, they really are. Uh, understanding that, um, you know, I have some, some friends, and even myself early on, some of the people I worked with were World War II vets. I learned a lot of business ethic from them. I got great work ethic, service ethic, working with those folks. What motivated them? It certainly was not the job that they were doing at that particular moment. It was the ethic that they grew up with. It was, it was fighting the war. It was being part of something big. It was being part of a team. It was the camaraderie. All of those things that worked. And so when they got into the civilian sector and they started to work, they were looking for opportunities to work in places where they had that camaraderie, that, camaraderie, that teamwork, where people were working together. They were not soloists. In today's modern world, a lot, of the, a lot of the younger folks are soloists. Because they grew up in a digital world, they don't, you know, we didn't have that. I was talking to somebody earlier about when I was in the Navy, and my wife was my fiance at the time, and I'm overseas for six, seven, eight months at a clip on my Navy ship. We didn't have email or cell phones. When we pulled into a port, if it was a friendly port, there was an international phone exchange, and we had to sign up on a waiting list, usually four to six hours to get an open line back to the States. And being a junior enlisted guy in the Navy, I didn't have a whole lot of money. So those calls were collect. Usually about four o'clock in the morning, and averaging about $17 a minute. So I don't know what motivated my wife to stay with me. <laughs> But she did, <laughs> understanding that you know, we, we, have, we, we all work in different kind of scenarios. And, and so what, the modern conveniences that we have now, people now in this younger generation, they take this for granted. Uh, quick, uh, another reference along those lines, and I'll get right to you. Uh, when I first started in this industry as a public affairs officer, a public affairs specialist, originally in the Navy as active duty, then in the state government and then in federal government, when I first started over three decades ago, there were dedicated beat reporters who understood what your organization did. They knew the history probably better than anybody who was at that command or at that, at that office. They could be trusted because they were, they were writing the story, right? They knew the stories. They were gonna get the facts right, no matter what. They were gonna get the facts right. They didn't have their own agenda. And they might only have to do one story a day or one story a week if it was a really good one. Nowadays, we don't have that luxury. Media is everywhere, it's all over. I mean, the average reporter has to do, a single story has to be put, to, put out in seven different formats. So they have to rewrite it differently for each of those formats. And they might have five, six, seven, ten stories they have to do that day. Most reporters nowadays are general assignment reporters. They have no time to focus. So 
I'm the media spokesman. I have to understand that this is what they're dealing with. When I first started, I understood those guys because they understood the story. And I can just quickly hook them up with my subject matter expert and didn't have to worry about a thing. Now, I have to educate everybody, and I know they only have very limited time and limited bandwidth. And so you have to take that in, into consideration and know what it is that's driving them to help them to get to where they need. Elizabeth, and then I don't know how much time we have. You know, if you look at what happened a few years ago, and it mostly was at the school children age, that whole everybody gets a trophy mindset. Okay? I don't know where it came from, but that person should have been choked. <laughs> but the whole concept of, of that everybody, everybody gets a trophy no matter what. Nobody wins, nobody loses. You all get the same reward no matter what kind of effort you put into it. It changed the way people performed. And so that's what happened to that mid-level management group right there because they didn't have for people who are willing to put forth a performance because they had no way to reward true performers and they had no way to punish people who didn't. And so they got kind of that, they kind of stagnated and said, you know, this is kind of ridiculous. So we're just going to give them a paycheck and that's all they need because that's all we can give them. That's been part of it. That's been probably a big part of it. It also depends on how their bosses treated them coming up too. I never had to care about my job. Uh, you first, then you. Well, again, this is something that's it's probably going to take a while to cycle out because there are folks that have that old mindset. Um, where an organization I worked with worked in in the past, we had the worst micromanaging leadership ever. When they first came in, they got behind closed doors. And they didn't communicate with anybody. We're like, what are they doing in there? When are we going to meet the new boss? And then finally, the door opened a little bit, and they said, we are evaluating every program that we're working on across this organization. And we will decide which ones we'll continue to do and which ones we won't. And they closed the door again. When they opened the door the next time, they said, you will have five minutes. Literally, I can't make this up. Five minutes to describe your program and why we should keep it. What do you think that did to the morale of this organization? Um, people were dropping like flies. Um, there were signs that I saw in several people's offices that said, the only difference between this place and the Titanic is the Titanic had a band. <laughs> and the three top managers, could, they wanted to see and approve everything everything. So I'm empowering you to do your job, but you've got to clear everything through me. Down to PowerPoint slide format, fact sheet layout, how headlines should be. I mean, the, mi the minutia, instead of letting people just do what you hired them for, there has to be a recognition that you are, somebody was hired for their professional expertise. You are giving them a paycheck for their professional expertise. If you're going to tell them exactly how to do stuff, then you obviously can just do it yourself because you don't need them. So those micromanaging folks, they left, finally. And it was a big hallelujah for everybody. New boss comes in, and he's empowering. He says, hey, you guys are the experts. I'm, I'm a political appointee. I'm here to help get things in motion and to make sure you've got the resources to do the work. But you've got to tell me what, what work is important. 
So he's the same thing. You're going to tell me what work is important. But I'm going to believe you. The first batch of folks didn't want to believe you. They're like, oh, no, you've got to convince me. This guy's like, I'm willing to believe you. So go forth and do good things. It's servant leadership, which has been out there for a little while now, and it's starting to gain a little more momentum. Servant leadership, you understand, have you heard of this concept? Okay, instead of having the top-down structure where the boss is up here, servant leadership goes this way. The boss's sole role is to provide the resources, the finances and whatever else is needed in order to enable these guys to get their work done. So, you, ma'am, and then I think, how are we on time? Okay. So, with that, it's on the old initiative that you have format, though. How do you penetrate that culture, even if you get rid of those managers, if it's been instilled and ingrained for so long with your team members and staff? That is such a critical question. That actually happened to several people when the new folks came in. And they said, go forth and do good things. Just tell me what you're doing. You know, tell me what I need to support and what you need to get there. And those folks were like, ah, I don't know. I haven't been able to make a decision in so long. And so they left. <laughs> so, so they didn't know how to function. And so there are people now, the big thing is trust. Okay, especially when you get new leadership that comes in and is trying to make these changes for the better. It's hard to trust those folks. And that trust factor is huge. Right now, people are looking and they're going, yeah, we think there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but past experience tells us it's probably an oncoming train. The culture issue, the damage to the culture of an organization is the hardest thing to overcome. Um, I know that several organizations, you know, God, these federal employee viewpoint surveys and all these, don't, I mean, you got to do them, yeah. And it's supposed to enlighten you to what's gone wrong in the organization, and that just really, you know, highlights the bad stuff. What you need to do is focus on the good things. What are the good things? What are the things that are working well in this organization? And highlight those people. Recognize those individuals who are doing the good work and showcasing the fact that they were enabled to make decisions and do jobs. Don't uh, punish them for taking risk. We want, that's the biggest thing. And I know that sometimes these mid-level managers don't want to do that. But when I first started working for the science and technology director at, at DHS, that leadership there had 10% of the budget went to programs that he was pretty sure were going to fail. But that's what R&D is all about, right? Research and development. He put 10% of the budget towards programs that he said, these are highly likely to fail, but I'm willing to take the chance because if any of these are successful, they're going to be game changers. So he took away that fear of failure, and people got inspired, and they got motivated to get out there and take chances and come up with innovative solutions. So other than chopping these people off in the knees who are still there, those old legacy folks who are still problematic, um, it, the main thing is to just, just um, get a look inside yourself and see what you can deal with and what you can't. And then understand how long are they going to be there? How long are you going to be there? Can you ride them out? Or can you just start doing stuff that, that you're motivated to do and live upon your own successes, knowing that you're probably not going to get recognized for it? Okay. So thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your time. That's all, my, that's all my contact info or whatever. Like I said, it's all on the bookmarks. And if you'd like one, I've got them up here. I'll put them up here on the stage. So thank you, John, for a fantastic, motivating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a gift for you that I'm afraid to break, so I'm not going to oh, take that it out of the box. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> I'm going to take it out of the box. And my wife is cringing. She's going, oh, he's a klutz. Actually, it's two pieces. <laughs> It's two pieces. Anybody ever gets one of these? It's two pieces. I'm telling you now because I went to pick it up by the base. Yes. <laughs> it is gorgeous. I'm yes. just going to leave it right there. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. You can just grab those. Yep. Uh, so thank you guys for, uh, for joining us this evening. On your way out, please remember to turn your badge in. If you could take a moment and fill out the survey on the back of the, um, on the badge, we'd really appreciate it. We love your feedback, and we want to know where you're finding value in the services we're providing for the chapter. So thank you so much.